Thanks for joining. Uh, this is the Weave Online User Group. Hopefully you can all see my slides. My name is Tamo Nakahara. Uh, I run the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. And we're very fortunate today to have Damien Lespiel from um, Weaveworks as well and our engineering team. Uh, he'll be talking about a project that he created called Footloose. Uh, and the subtitle here is Containers That Look Like VMs. Uh, so uh, just a little bit about us. Our company is called Weave Works, and we're a startup based in London, San Francisco, Berlin, and New York, and distributed teams. If you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO, CTO, and some of our engineers are the people who created the technology and sold the company to VMware. Uh, and then they started noticing needs in the container space and evolved uh, projects and then products that uh, then came incorporated under our company called WeaveWorks. Uh, we are funded by a couple of VCs, including Excel, Excel Partners. Um, another one is also Google Ventures. Uh, and I mention that, uh, as you'll see, because we are quite deeply involved in the Kubernetes space. So it makes sense as part of our uh, being in the Google family. Uh, our company is founded on open source. Uh, here are just some of the projects that we have here. Obviously, uh, Footloose is one of them that you'll hear about today. Uh, one of our earliest ones was oh, WeaveNet, uh, which still continues and is developed as one of the premier ways to network in Kubernetes clusters. Uh, then we also have Cortex, which builds upon Prometheus and makes it scalable. Um, that is in the CNCF. Uh, we have Flux that also just recently uh, joined as a sandbox project into the CNCF, uh, and that does automated deployments uh, and other GitOps capabilities. In fact, it's part of what led us to create the term GitOps, which hopefully you've heard about. Uh, and then we've Scope, uh, which helps with observability and visualization of your container clusters. One of our more recent um, projects that you've probably heard about is uh, Flagger, which uh, creates automated progressive delivery uh, on service meshes. Uh, and we have plenty more, for example, the one you'll hear about today. Uh, we also are a company uh, with products. Uh, probably heard of Weave Cloud, which is our SaaS product uh, that helps you with Kubernetes management, uh, automated deployments, uh, and um, monitoring. And uh, some of those projects that I mentioned, Cortex, Scope, Scope and Flux, uh, create some of the underpinnings of that SaaS product. Uh, we have been running Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS for four years now. Uh, and so now we're in the process of actually productizing the Kubernetes platform that we built to do that. Uh, and so it's very much a GitOps aware enterprise platform. So if you're getting started with Kubernetes, uh, please let us know and uh, we could give you uh, information on that platform. And since we've been running Kubernetes in production for over four years, uh, we obviously have a lot of experience that gets built into some consulting and training support as people need as they get started with the platform or with our management product. So weave.works is our website. If you've never seen it before, please check us out and let us know if you have any questions. A little bit of housekeeping here. So as I mentioned, we're very fortunate to have Damien Lespiau, who's one of our engineers based in the London office. Uh, my name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team based in San Francisco. And these sessions, if you've come to these Weave online user groups before, uh, can be as short as 30 minutes, um, but usually range around 45. Uh, and then we do a hard stop at 60 minutes if there are many, many questions and discussion going on. We'll let it go a little bit over, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60. But um, depending on the length of the talk and the number of the questions, um, we'll do about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, we're using a platform called Zoom. So if you have questions, please use the chat box. Um, you can find the button usually on the top left corner of your screen. If you don't see it, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and you can see more functionality uh, of Zoom. Uh, when you ask your question or sometimes answer, please make sure to uh, direct your chat to everyone or to all panelists, attendees, whatever it is, choose from the drop down menu because uh, otherwise it'll just come to me and no one will be able to see your questions. So um, please make sure you post to everyone unless you have something that's burningly private. Uh, and Damien, sorry, remind me, uh, do you prefer questions throughout or at the end? Um, question throughout is, is totally fine. Feel okay. free to interrupt at any time. Yeah. Okay, so please uh, post your questions in the chat and I'll uh, work to relay them to Damien. So with that, I will hand it over to Damien. Let me know if uh, you can take over the share. Yeah, I can.
right. Should I have my screen? Looks good. Uh, uh, we have a first question. Any recording? I think you are recording, Tamara. Tamara? Uh, yes, we are recording these and we post these to YouTube. You'll get an email after the uh, event for the link. So I'm going to talk about Footloose. And Footloose is something that started as an internal project and was open sourced in February, I think, or March. And very simply put, is something we say is, is something to create containers that looks like VM. I'll, I'll spend some time explaining why we did that and how we use it. Um, but maybe we can start with demos. I don't have any slides, I only have demos um, because it's, it's kind of interesting to have hands on experience with that. So that's, I have about eight things to talk about. Uh, we can go straight into the first one, which is let's, let's quickly see what it's all about. Um, so maybe if people, maybe the easiest way to think about Footloose is to uh, have a parallel with Vagrant. Vagrant is a tool that has been created a long time ago by HashiCorp to be able to launch VM on developer's laptop. Footloose is the same, but instead of launching VMs, it launches containers. And to just give a quick example, um, I'm going to create three VMs. That's it. Um, what can you do with those VMs? Well, you can SH in. Oops, that's not what I wanted. You can SH in. Um, here we go. I switch into the first VM. So if you look at, if you look around, it looks like a virtual machine. It has in its system actually system D. Um, general D is running. SSH D is running. That's why you can switch in. I have Dbus daemon running. And you know, I'm running Ubuntu. And if you look at um, etcos release, this is actually Fedora. So what happened? Um, what actually happened is I have a small footloose.yml file that tells me I want to create a cluster of three machines and every machine has to run CentOS 7. Um, and those machines are actually Docker containers. So if you look at Docker PS, the three machines that have been created are those three containers that are running, uh, SB in, has been in it as the first, as the PID one of the container, and SB in it is, of course, systemd. And beyond that, we're running SISH. It's quite simple, really. The whole core of Fruitloose is Docker container that runs systemd, and a bit of a common line to, to wrap that around. So what, what, what can you do with that? Well, we have a Fruitloose show command that would tell you that this cluster of three machines is running, and a few details about the nodes, it's running. Uh, you can store and start nodes, um, just like VMs or containers. So these, you know, you've just, um, they are in state stop, to just stop three containers. And you can start them again. Um, quite basic things. Of course, it means you can SSH, let's say SSH um, the node one this time, and you have them. And you can delete them. So very simple operations, create virtual machine, stop and start them and delete them. Um, the interesting part is the speed of it. Starting a new machine is actually a few seconds. Um, sorry. So I create three machines about three seconds. Uh, compared to having vague background that takes minutes to run is quite, quite a support, quite a nice improvement. And the reason we use that is, well, whenever you need a VM running a special OS, then you can use that, really. Um, so I'm going to continue sh to show that you can do a lot with those containers. Um, so the next demo is running Docker in Docker. Actually, let me create just to. I'm just going to delete the, the VM so I have a nice state every time. I have a nice clean state. 
So then the next thing we can do is um, I'm just creating a new VM and accessing into it. And let's try to install. So we're I mean, I'm still in a container, of course. Let's try to install Docker in, in here. And because it's you know it's supposed to mirror what the VM does, you can install packages. It's just regular OS. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to install Docker, and I'm going to run to run it <laughs> quite quite simply. So that wh what it will mean? It will mean that we'll uh, show you maybe the PS tree of all the processes after that. But it's going, it's, it means that we're going to run the Docker daemon inside a container, which is itself run by the Docker daemon. So we have a Docker in Docker setup that is working um, with this. And we'll see why, well, how it can be used later on um, for fun and profit. Right, so we we'll just go through installing the Docker container. It's very interesting. We can start. We can start it. it because we run systemd as pid one in this container. All the systemd commands do work. So we can um, start the Docker daemon and then run uh, the container. So for instance, I'm just going to run sleep, sleep for an hour, and the Docker daemon works and everything. The reason it works is because we map the C group, we do a bunch of interesting things to make all of that work. For instance, we um, mount the C group FS uh, file system from the host inside a container. So the Docker D inside the, the, the container can actually access the, the, the C group API from, from the host kernel. kernel. Um, so what happens here in the, in the in, inside the, the container, we have our Sleep360 running. If we get if we go outside, we can see on the host though, we can see our sleep process that has been here. So the sleep process is running inside the container that you see here. And this con this container is running so you, you, you can see let's let's have a look. Bit maybe closer. So sleep 360 is running here. You, we can see that has been in it is actually the systemd running inside the container. One of its children is the Docker D daemon, and we also have container D and the shim is the usual Docker things. And then sleep 360 is running here. And if you look on the other side of the tree, the systemd is actually a child of the the host Docker daemon that is here. So we have Docker D, System D, Docker D, and then sleep. Um, that's it, really. That's, that's it for, for this. I'm still going to delete the container. So we have this. It's just me um, wanted to show how the flow works. So next step is something slightly different. Um, just to show that we can run different OSs at once. So in this, in this configuration, I have a cluster of three machines, one running CentOS 7, one running Fedora 29, and one running Ubuntu 18.04. And when I do run Fedora's Create, then I'm going to end up going the, creating those three machines, and I can session to say, the Fedora 29 um, machine. Um, okay, let's do it. And here we go, we are in the Fedora machine. People have been using that to test Ansible scripts, to tell installers, to, to test Kubernetes installers, etc. So that's just, just a way to show you that we can create a lot of different OSs. Next step is Kubernetes. Um, so because Docker, and Docker, Docker in Docker works, we can actually use Docker to install Kubernetes on top of it. And that's what I just did here. Um, I have a footloose cluster of two machines. And I've installed offline, I've installed 
a Kubernetes cluster on top of that. And I can show you that it works. Uh, so, maybe we do get close. so I have a Kubernetes cl cluster running here. Uh, we can SSH into the first node, let's say, and see that. Uh, see, uh, oh, because I don't have the. Uh, okay, l l let's not do that. Let's look at the tree of. Processes. So if you look at again the tree of processes, what we see is we have the host Docker, Docker running systemd, running Docker and containerd here, and then as children of containerd, I have all the post containers from Do from from um, Kubernetes. I have the API server from Kubernetes. I have etcd running on the the master node, uh, the scheduler. The control manager and then crew proxy, etc. So what we can, what we've done here is create a two-node cluster, one master, one worker, and it's all running in containers within uh, within within your your host. And that is the real reason why we built uh, Fruitloose is to be able to quickly spin two nodes, um, test our installer based on kubeadm and and cluster API in various configurations uh, and then tear down the cluster and it's all very quickly it's all very quick we use that every day and it's for us it's been a very very good improvement in our de development speed and testing speed so i think it's time to um, step back a bit and describe maybe how how the whole thing works slightly more in, in finer details so the the, the core the core of it is really Docker images running systemd. And it's quite simple, really. It's those Docker images derived from a base OS that is maintained by the community, usually actually the vendor of those OSs. So for instance, we can derive from Fedora 29. Um, this is a trick. Uh, to tell systemd that we actually are running inside Docker, and systemd will adapt its behavior knowing this it, it runs inside a Docker container. And on top of the base image, you can do whatever you want. For instance, you can say, I want to install the uh, sudo and shd and procps, so for 2fps running, and a bunch of tools. And you're basically saying, I want an image with systemd uh, running SSH. Uh, we expose the SSH, SSH port, and this is a small detail uh, f to, to say, to tell Docker how to kill systemd properly. And that's it really, that's that's all you need to create a Docker image that runs systemd. Of course, this, this one is a good example that all, that all works very nicely. For Ubuntu, it's a bit more complicated to have Ubuntu working correctly, we had to hack things a bit. But that's the value of, of Footloose is we maintain a, a set of base images that let you run Docker container as VMs. And to show you the, the wealth of images we have, these, these are the OSs you can run within Footloose without any work really. You can just reuse them. Okay, and the rest of Footloose is really a few, a bit of a wrapper around Docker and the Docker API to start containers, um, to delete them, to start and start them, etc. At least it's how it started. Uh, now we have a bit of a, uh, we can kill maybe the, the, the Kubernetes cluster now. <laughs> um, so this is how it started. But recently, we've um, introduced Ignite. And Ignite is an interesting project uh, from Lucas, actually, that has been studied by Lucas here at Wheatworks. And what, what Ignite does, it, it starts actual VMs running Firecracker. And inside those Firecracker VMs, you are running a container. That's a bit another meta thing to do. Um, and the interesting bit is Lucas has worked to integrate Ignite with Footloose. 
which means now instead of just creating containers, Footloose can actually create real VMs and run the containers inside those VMs. Um, there's not much differences uh, between a configuration file for launching containers and a configuration file to launch real VMs. Uh, it needs two key things, a backend equal Ignite to tell Footloose to use the Ignite backend, um, and some configurations to tell Ignite how the VM should be configured. And in this case, we want two vCPUs, a bit of memory, one gig, this much of disk size, and we want to use this kernel. So now when we do footless create, um, what happens is instead of talking to the Docker container, to the Docker daemon to create containers, we actually are talking to Ignite and KVM, really, to start, and Firecracker, to start VMs. But the UX works the same. We can SSH into uh, the first node. And here we go, we have started three VMs, uh, booted the Linux kernel, SSH into them. So if, you, if, you, if you look inside the VM now, we can see we actually are running a real Linux kernel that has just booted. Um, we, we'll, we have a custom kernel 419, whereas on the host we have um, 4, 4, that's 4, 4. So that's just a proof that we have booted uh, the kernel. But you can see it in the in the uh, PS as well, because here you can see all the k-threads that are running. And same principles always, we're, we run systemd in those, in those um, containers, and we run this stage. In this case, we can actually we can also run full Kubernetes clusters on top of that, but this time it has a real isolation uh, from the host. We actually are creating a VM and using the, the hardware uh, to to spawn a new a new virtual machine and boot a new kernel inside inside the machine. That's quite exciting to provide real isolation and better testing uh, purposes. One note, though, is the Ignite backend only works on Linux because it needs Firecracker and it needs to actually have KVM installed. Whereas the regular um, Footloose also work on Mac. All you need is Docker daemon running. So you can create Linux VMs on Mac as well this way. So that's that's it. That's the for for the first few basic demos, where we just show how to start VMs and sometimes VMs are containers, sometimes VMs are actual VMs. It's up to you to decide. So now we're going to see a few other use cases that people have been using Fruitless for and maybe interesting for other people. So the first thing is because where you're actually running are Docker containers, well, you can just use, you can create, you can derive from those Docker containers to create your own Docker images and do exactly what you want with them. And this example actually does exactly that. So what we're doing here is we're deriving from one of the Fruitless images, one that is actually running Ubuntu 18.04. We're installing the Apache in that image. We're copying a bit of HTML that we're going to serve, of course. We tell systemd, please enable this Apache service, because you know, it may be useful, and expose port 80. So when you create the image, so actually I can maybe show you uh, how this is configured, is we just need to tell that we want to create one machine with Apache, the Apache image that I just built. We can add session to the node maybe to, to see how this has changed things. Oops. Sometimes it takes a bit of time to, to do that. Come on. <laughs> okay, here we go. 
Um, so we're, if we look at the, the processes inside that container, what we actually see is that Apache has started as well. And when we, uh, so we're loading the page here, we can actually see that the port has been exposed. Um, if you look at the configuration a bit above, we're exposing the port 80 as port 8080 on the host. And we, we can serve the index that has been copied into the, um, the container. That's the same as this one. So really what it means here is that you can craft your the Docker containers that you're going to uh, run with Footloose with any service really that you, you, you want. And this way you can mock containers, you can mock full environments, you can mock container registries, you can mock Apache servers, you can mock RPM registries, you can mock anything you really want to. Uh, and that's something we really use in CI. Um, we, we can start a bunch of virtual machines that are actually our containers in seconds, uh, providing full isolation uh, and providing repeated environments you can repeat, both in your developer machine and on CI quite easily. Um, so I'll, I'll show you something a bit more exciting, is that we can then we can provision things on top of Footloose VMs with Ansible, just like they were any other VMs. Um, so in, the, in this case, I can show you the config file to explain what I'm doing. Um, so we are creating three VMs, one called proxy, um, that will host a squid proxy, which is a HTTP proxy. And then we have two, um, two nodes running CentOS that we just created. Uh, but I'm going to install squid on the proxy machine and configure the node machine to go through the squid proxy through using Ansible. So what I have here is a Ansible playbook um, that does exactly that. It will install Squid. It has a squid.conf to uh, configure the proxy. And then it will configure the two nodes um, to use that proxy by just modifying etcd etc, etc environment. Uh, so that's the Ansible playbook invocation. Um, so, of course, when you, have, when you have those VMs, Ansible can be configured to just uh, know about them. Uh, actually, this may not work because I have... Yeah, I'll, I'll modify things as I So, what the Ansible playbook is doing is um, installing screen in the, first, in the proxy machine now it's going to configure it. Squid.conf is copy squid.conf, restart squid with the new configuration, and then it will log into the two nodes and configure etc environment to have HTTP proxy environment variables point at the proxy. Um, one thing here is that the squid proxy is actually O2 in the Docker on the Docker network, so I actually have to change the playbook to say I want um, I want the environment to I want the environment variables on the nodes to point to point at the right IP address for the proxy. I can run my, my playbook again and you will just skip as of course with Ansible you will skip things that are already working and just modify the environment variables on on the two nodes. Okay. Okay, going through it. So now to just to show that it all works, we can um, we can tail the squid access log in on the proxy node using Fukus SSH. What this command is doing is please SSH into the proxy VM and tail 
the access logo of, of the squid access logo. And we can uh, we can search into the first node, let's say, issue an HTTP command, and we'll we'll see that we've been configured the the node zero has been configured to proxy all these HTTP requests through the squid proxy. So maybe we can just uh, wget google.com. And if you switch back to the log, we can see that, you know, of course, everything works as intended. The, the proxy has captured or has logged that we, we, we went through it to access Google. So once again, this is kind of a more complex setup to, to, to show you that you can have fairly complex setup being reproduced um, easily using Fruitless VMs in seconds, really. Um, like, because actually, what you know, we, we did a bit of work here. The Ansible playbook was installing Squid, but we could um, craft that into the Fruitless uh, image, to, into a container image, to have things provisioned from container images already. Uh, but the main thing is we, we have been able to reproduce a configuration where we had two VMs going through a proxy. Um, and that's for us, it was useful to be able to install Kubernetes in such an environment where we don't necessarily have the internet access on the nodes, on the Kubernetes nodes themselves, but we have to go through a proxy to download images or to access registries, etc. Um, people have been doing quite crazy things with Footloose. Uh, for instance, this uh, Carlos uh, works at Red Hat. Um, has been using Fruitloose to have one, to have an OpenShift one node cluster, OpenShift cluster on top of Fruitloose. Um, and that's quite useful. If you look at the instructions, it's it's a few um, commands to start a Kubernetes cluster without an EVM on your machine actually running OpenShift. Uh, people have been using that at Red Hat a bit to, to develop. And I'm going to finish um, by showing a new feature that is in development, which is um, REST API. So right now I've shown commands and configuration files, but we can actually access the same um, runtime through a REST API. So to show you how it works, we can create a cluster, and then we can create a machine and the body of the request is actually the same, the same object that we've been seeing in the fruitless.yaml files, but here as JSON. And when, when you send a post request through that, we, you actually create a VM that you can see um, here. That's the one we created um, here. So soon coming into Footloose is a REST API to be able to have a long-running Footloose server uh, where you can create and delete clusters of, of VMs through an API. Um, here it is. That's all I had for today. Um, I didn't have the questions, but do we have any questions? Yes. Um. Uh. It's, I'm just reading it a little bit. Uh, uh, okay. So it says um, this could possibly have a smaller memory footprint than vagrant virtual boxes VMs. Um, so yep. can we use more footloose and less virtual box VMs? Are there any limitations compared to virtual box VMs? For example, networking shared volumes. Um, yep, so that, that's a good question. Um, so you're absolutely right. First, your first thing is, yes, you're absolutely right. It's smaller footprint because you don't have to start a VM. You, it's just another process. And then a slightly bit of overhead with the container D uh, scheme process, but that's, that's super tiny compared to an actual VM, of course. Um, so instead of being able to launch maybe three VMs 
you know, four VMs on a beefy develop, development machine, a, a, a laptop, really, you can create 50, um, 50 containers, it, no problem. Um, so, yeah, you can absolutely use less virtual, virtual box VMs and more fruitless VMs. That's what we have been using. I haven't been using any um, virtual box VMs since we have, or any vagrant uh, VMs which uses virtual box sometimes. Um, since we have fruitless, uh, absolutely. Limitations. Um, so, networking wise, <laughs> networking wise, um, the fruitless VMs are in the Docker network. So, it has the same limitation as the Docker network, which you can do so many things with that, that we haven't seen any problem. Um, it uses the bridge network, the Docker bridge network by default because it's the Docker network. But you can use any Docker plugin and any Docker network plugin uh, in conjunction with Fruitless VMs. Um, we haven't shown it, but inside the configuration file, you can actually, actually tell Fruitless to use a pre configured uh, Docker network that already exists. Um, so the, the answer is. I no, I don't think I've seen any limitations on the networking side. Uh, the limitations, though, are you have to share the kernel inside the Footloose VM with the host kernel, which means slash sys and sysfs is the same between the two. So if you if you want to start, um, you can run tables, you can run all of that just like in the Docker container, uh, you can run Fuse file systems if you mount the Fuse file system um, device from the host network, for instance. But anything that has that is too close to hardware might be difficult to use within a Fruitloose VM. You can mount device uh, devices inside the Fruitloose VM, just like any Docker VM. But it, it, you might find some limitations uh, if you have to tweak some um, CFS nodes, uh, CSFS files, or IP stack tunables, you, know, you, you, you might find some limitations here. But you know, we have been able to run a full Kubernetes cluster within that. And Kubernetes, Kubernetes and CNI plugins do a lot of things with the IP stack and IP tables. And it, it has been working well so far for us. Um, shared volumes is we use the shared volumes from from Docker, um, so you can reuse that. Yeah. Yes, we 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 run Kubernetes nodes on Fruitloose. The kubelet is actually running on inside a Fruitloose container. Um, that's why we have Docker in Docker running because we have a foot kubelet talking to the Docker inside the container to do all the Kubernetes things. Um, so the examples can be shared. Yes, absolutely. We have these examples are in the Fruitloose. So Fruitloose is an open source project. It's in Weaveworks, in the GitHub, uh, Weaveworks Git, uh, GitHub. It's in the Fruitloose project. And if you look at the readme, you have a bunch of other examples here um, that are listed here. Um, the Docker in Docker, the custom image, the Apache example here, App the OpenShift example is here. Uh, I have a couple more. I haven't the full squid example, but I, I'll, I'll add it uh, to it. It's a more interesting Ansible example than, than the basic one we have here. But it's the same principle. If you know how to make an Ansible playbook, then you'll be able to take this small Ansible example and run Ansible, your Ansible playbook on fruitless DMs. Ah, difference with LXE. Well, we are all using Docker. There's actually a fact here. Um, it's not that different in terms of, it's just like, you know, if you say, what's the difference between LXE and Docker? Well, you run containers in both cases, um, you know, so whatever. Uh, but if, a, a very, very good point for 
Docker is that you can use Docker on macOS, which means we can run fruitless VMs on macOS today. And actually, my, my development team, I think two people are running Linux, and the rest are using, are using uh, macOS. And we use fruitless every day. So we, we've been able to reproduce our development environments on macOS uh, using Fruitloose and create a lot of VMs based on that. So th for me, the main, um, the main tool is just like Vagrant, you can run VMs, uh, Fruitloose VMs on Mac and Linux uh, and probably Windows as well, but we have no one really using Windows. Uh, wherever Docker runs, you can run Docker VMs, uh, Fruitloose VMs. So that's the main differences with LXE, I would say. Um, right, so the, the API functionality that we have at the end is, um, has been added because we want to have processes able to create and delete VMs at will, and that's to be able to use, uh, that's to be able to implement a cluster API controller that can scale Kubernetes nodes on demand so you have to imagine that we have a footloose cluster running uh, an HA Kubernetes cluster. So we have three master nodes in HA configuration with a number of, of um, worker nodes. But what we want to be able to, to do is um, have a, a controller running in this Kubernetes cluster, creating footloose VMs on demand and joining them to the cluster. Um, and that's why we have a long running process and API, so we can do that from a Kubernetes controller, we can add VMs on demand. Um, and that's something exciting we'll be able to talk about at some point in the very near future, but I can't talk about it now uh, around creating a Kubernetes cluster this way. Um, yes, so the next question is absolutely, um, we run Kubernetes nodes on top of Footloose VMs. Um, so the Ansible example is, yeah, I think actually the Ansible may be the most used use case outside of uh, WeaveWorks that I've been hearing. A lot of people are using Footloose to test Ansible playbooks against a variety of clusters of, of of OS's, OS's versions, um, CI as well, because, because you know, it takes one second to start a VM you're running Fedora 28 or t Fedora 29 and then Ubuntu 19, you can test your Ansible playbooks in, in CI very, very quickly and people like that. Um, yeah, that's quite cool. Um, I think that's, that, that is definitely... Uh, the... A fruitless example has no URL right now um, because I've been using a closed source component to use the, the, uh, the cluster in this example. But I can tell you that this is the same thing as creating the VMs and then running, running kubeadm to create a master node and then kubeadm join to join the nodes to the master nodes. So this is exactly the same as running a VM and running any Kubernetes examples using kubeadm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly why we created that. We run out of memory um, with VirtualBox uh, very quickly, and we wanted to be able to run multi-nodes uh, Kubernetes clusters. So multi-master, you know, multi-master clusters. We want three nodes, three master nodes, three worker nodes. And we can't actually do that with the box. Uh, something interesting, so you know, for us it's interesting because we are testing at the kubeadm level. So we needed a bare machine uh, and then run a kubeadm SSH into it and run kubeadm on top of that. But what might be interesting for your example, you may not know about it, is, is kind, Kubernetes kind. Um, that's something somewhat new. And this is using exactly the same principles as Footloose is using. And you can, and, but they go a bit beyond that. They only care about 
the I can link that in the chat. Maybe. They only care about creating Kubernetes clusters. So they don't offer you the general VM um, access. So they don't really create an SSH. Uh, they don't really run SSHD and let you SSH into nodes. They only interested in creating Kubernetes clusters. But Kind is using Docker to and a specially craft Docker container to look like a VM, and then they run Kubernetes on, on inside that. Uh, so if you're only interested in creating a Kubernetes cluster, a one-node Kubernetes cluster, quickly, you may be interested in using Kind. Um, if you're interested in running an Ansible playbook, for instance, you, you definitely want Freecluse. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> I guess um, we could definitely follow up. Uh, I don't know if other people would want to hear about those details about our products, but um, yes, thanks for asking, and uh, we'll definitely follow up with you. And anything you want to learn about that, we will certainly help you with that. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Um, so it looks like we're nicely winding down. I will share my closing slide. Uh, Hopefully you guys can see this. It's always a little bit of an issue when, you guys can see my slide? It's always a little bit of an issue with Zoom when uh, swapping slides. Yes, um, excellent. So yeah, if, the, if you are new to our um, Weave Online user groups, um, generally we meet on Tuesdays at this time. Sometimes we have special ones. For example, tomorrow we have a special one um, that covers how Flux has joined the CNCF, uh, CNCF as a sandbox project. So we'll have the team there and answer any questions. And if anybody wants to use Flux or has questions about Flux or wants to contribute, then uh, please join tomorrow. Uh, and then next week we'll be back to our Tuesday time uh, on EKS and EKS Cuddle. Uh, if you are interested in starting up with EKS and would like a nice on-ramping with the EKS Cuddle that one of our team members created, um, or have any questions otherwise to contribute, uh, please join us next week. We'll have uh, Ilya from our team as well as uh, Michael Hassenbloss, um from AWS joining for that. So thanks again. Thank you, Damien, for taking the time to present. And thanks, everybody, for your fantastic questions. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.